A very good evening, aspirants. As prelims is fast approaching, I have a very good news to share with you all. See, the main step to succeed in the UPSC preparation is to check your progress. For that, you need to attend the mock test. Am I right? Realizing this, the Shankar IAS Academy has come up with the All India Prelims Mock Test, which is completely free for you. And it is held across 13 centers in both online and offline mode. See, there are three All India Mock Tests that is available in free mode. Note that it is freely available. So, kindly utilize it and check your progress of preparation so that you succeed with bright colors in this UPSC prelims. See, if you ask me the dates for the All India Mock Test, there are three mock tests. One will be on May 15th, second will be on May 22nd and the third one will be on May 29th. Friends, kindly make use of this opportunity to analyze your preparation and enrich your preparation with the three mock tests that is completely free. Okay. Now with this good news, let's move on to the Hindu newspaper analysis for the date 26th of April 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that I have chosen for today's discussion. See, today all these topics are mainly concentrated on prelims perspective also, I have made a point to address how to utilize these points for mains. Okay. And as I always assure you, today also I had covered an economic topic under that many economic terms has been covered. See, these terms are very much useful for attending your preliminary questions. So, utilize this opportunity to brush up these concepts for your exam. Okay. Now, without wasting much time, let's get into the first news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. This article is about vermins. See the article says that the state government has requested the center to declare wild pigs as vermin. But center declined the request by saying that declaring wild pigs as vermin would result in indiscriminate killing of the animal and thereby disturbing the balance of the ecosystem. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this discussion, we are going to see about what are vermins and the procedure for declaration of a particular animal as vermin. Okay. First of all, what is a vermin? The literal meaning of vermin is wild animals which are believed to be harmful to crops, farm animals or the ones which carry diseases which in turn is harmful to human beings. In simple words, these are either animals or pests that are harmful to crops, humans and livestock. Okay. Interesting thing here is that the term vermin which is most commonly used for rodents and insects is now increasingly applied to bigger animals. Even in the article that we have taken, the state government has requested to declare wild pigs as vermins. Am I right? See, to know more about the vermins in India, we should know about the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. See, we all know about the Wildlife Protection Act as an act which protects and preserves animals and wildlife in the country. And we know that the statute endless detailed provisions for ensuring the flourishing of India's flora and fauna. And generally, it penalizes the killing of any of the protected animals enlisted under the schedules of the act. But know that WPA only governs vermin in India. Here you should know that the Wildlife Protection Act or WPA 1972 nowhere in its text defines the word vermin. According to the act, vermin means any wild animal specified in Schedule 5. However, in Section 62 of the act, it deals with the declaration of wild animals as vermins. See, Section 62 says that the central government may by notification declare any wild animal other than those specified in Schedule 1 and Part 2 of Schedule 2 to be vermin for any area and for such period of time as specified in this notification. Okay. See, it means that center by notification can declare a wild animal as vermin. So, this will be included in Schedule 5 of this Act and it will be included in the Schedule 5 for a particular period of time and that time will be mentioned in the notification. Okay, and know that the center cannot declare animals that are specified in the schedule 1 and part 2 of the schedule 2 as vermin. This is very much important, that is why I am repeating this point. Okay, 
so the inclusion of any animal under the category of vermin legalizes their killing in specified areas for a limited period of time the request for the declaration of any wild animal as vermin is put forth by the concerned state government before the central government here under the central government means under the ministry of environment forest and climate change okay and the request should be accompanied with the reasons for requesting the same that is the state government should mention for what reason they are saying that this animal should be declared as vermin okay now what will the central government do the central government will take into account a lot of factors such as the species that is to be declared as vermin and its population in the area and the reasons why the species should be declared as vermin and after this only they may or may not issue a notification specifying the details regarding the districts and period of time for which the animal should be considered as vermin okay so there is no compulsion on the central government to declare any animal as vermin if the state government is requesting and note that animals in the schedule 5 include common crow fruit bats mice and rats okay so here in this article that we have taken the center has refused the request that was made by the state government to declare wild pigs as vermin this is because wild pig is one of the main prey species for large carnivores like tigers and leopards it also helps in checking the population of invertebrate pests and also the union ministry for environment forest and climate change has suggested that the use of the provisions of section 11 clause 1b of wildlife protection act 1972 by the state government for what is this suggested it is suggested to manage the wild pig without adversely affecting the state of the ecosystem see here i have a homework for you read about the section 11 clause 1b of this wildlife protection act i think you can generally go through section 11 alone i'll provide you with the link and just go through it it deals with the permission to hunt wild animals in certain cases why am i mentioning this see no how it is different from declaring an animal as vermin and killing them in specified cases alone okay so that's all about this news article in this we had covered an important prelims topic which is about vermin and what are all the animals that are declared as vermin and under which act it is declared and who is going to declare it all those details i have provided in this discussion so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article in the business page it is about the data from center for monitoring indian economy that is cmie and according to the report only 40% of indians of legal working age were employed or were looking for jobs in the year 2021 to 2022 here the labor force participation rate is low when compared to 46% in the year 2016 to 17 See in absolute terms India's labor force has decreased from about 445 million to 435 million in the past 6 years. Currently about 1085 million Indians are aged 15 or above and can be legally employed. Now when we look at the labor force participation among women it has declined further. In the year 2016 to 17 about 15% of women were employed or looking for jobs. See this has dipped to 9.2 percentage in the year 2021 to 2022. Then when you see among men the participation rate declined to 67 percentage from 74 percentage. Also know that the dip in the participation rate was higher in the urban areas. And according to the report the labor participation rate in rural areas fell to 41.4 percentage from 46.9 percentage. and the rate dropped in all the states except in Rajasthan then two southern states experienced sharp decline in the labor participation rates who are they one is tamil nadu and the other one is andhra pradesh see these statistics can be used to enrich your mains answer so make a note of these points and this is about the article and in this backdrop now let us see some basic economic terms See considering the importance of availability of labor force data 
at more frequent time intervals the national statistical office that is nso launched the periodic labor force survey that is plfs this was launched on april 2017 and on the basis of this survey quarterly bulletins are brought out giving estimates of labor force indicators like you can say labor force participation rate worker population ratio unemployment rate then distribution of workers by broad status in employment and industry then work in the current weekly status for the urban areas so with this basic understanding let us see about the labor force participation rate the labor force participation rate is an estimate of an economy's active workforce See, labor force participation rate is defined as a section of working population in the age group of 15 to 59 in the economy who are currently employed or seeking employment. Okay, the formula is the number of people who are employed or actively seeking employment divided by total working age population. Okay. See the labor force participation rate is defined as the percentage of population in the labor force. Now comes the question what is this labor force see labor force refers to the part of the population which supplies or offers to supply labor for pursuing economic activities for the production of goods and services therefore it includes both employed and unemployed persons okay but it is different from work force because workforce refers to the number of persons actually working and does not account for those who are willing to work so you can say that the workforce is the actual measurement of persons working or the number of persons with a job understood now coming to the unemployment rate see unemployment rate is defined as a percentage of unemployed persons in the labor force that is the number of people who are unemployed or do not have job divided by the total working age population so i hope you would have understood some of the major difference between labor force and work force and to make it simple i had made it as a formula for you to keep in mind see these terms can be put into a preliminary question that is why i had taken this opportunity to brush you up with these concepts okay so that's all about this news article so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article here it talks about the supreme court's direction to the states and union territories the direction is for the states and union territories who have not yet framed their own policies to rehabilitate children in street situations see the supreme court has asked the states and ut to immediately implement the standard operating procedure for care and protection of children in street situation 2.0 this was framed by the national commission for protection of child rights that is ncpcr for the time being this is the crux of the article given here in this context let us see about this national commission for the protection of child rights in prelims perspective see the national commission for protection of child rights was set up in march 2007 This was set up under the Commission for Protection of Child Rights Act 2005. So, the NCPCR is a statutory body under the Commission for Protection of Child Rights Act 2005. Okay? And it is under the administrative control of the Ministry of Women and Child Development. The commission's mandate is to ensure that all laws, policies, programs and administrative mechanisms are in consonance with the child rights perspective and this is enshrined in the constitution of india and also the un convention on the rights of the child okay now let us see whom do they define as a child here see here a child is defined as a person in the age group of 0 to 18 years now with this basic understanding let us see some of the functions of this national commission for protection of child rights okay Firstly it examines and reviews the safeguards provided by law in force for the protection of child rights and it recommends measures for their effective implementation also Secondly it presents to the central government reports upon working of the safeguards for children and thirdly it inquires into violation of child rights and recommends initiation of proceedings in such cases Fourthly it examines all factors that inhibit the enjoyment of rights of children affected by 
terrorism, communal violence, riots, natural disaster, domestic violence, HIV or AIDS, trafficking, maltreatment, torture and exploitation, then pornography and prostitution. And finally, they recommend appropriate remedial measures also. Fifthly, it looks into matters relating to children in need of special care and protection, including children in distress, marginalized and disadvantaged children, then children in conflict with law, juveniles, children without family and children of prisoners. And here also they recommend appropriate remedial measures. Okay. And the sixth function is it studies the treaties and other international instruments and undertake periodic review of existing policies, programs on child rights and make recommendations for their effective implementation. And the seventh function is it undertakes and promotes research in the field of child rights. They doesn't stop here. They also bring in some social behavioral changes in the society. How do they do so? See, they spread child rights literacy among various sections of the society and promotes awareness through publications, media, seminars and other available means. Then it inspects any juvenile custodial home or any other place of residence or institution meant for children where the children are detained or lodged for the purpose of treatment, reformation or protection. Okay, so we can understand they have the right to inspect also. And lastly, it inquires into compliance and takes suomoto notice of matters that are related to deprivation and violation of child rights, then non-implementation of laws providing for protection and development of children, then for the non-compliance of policy decisions, guidelines or instructions aimed at mitigating hardships and ensuring welfare of the children. Okay, so that's all about this news article. In this, we have seen an important topic for your prelims, which is the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. See, it is a statutory body. It is very important. Remember that. And its functions also. Please go through all the functions. It will be very much useful for answering your prelims questions. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this editorial article. See, this news article talks about the energy security of South Asia. To be specific, it talks about South Asia's electricity generation. See, the electricity policies of South Asian countries aim at providing electricity to every household. The objective is to supply reliable and quality electricity in an efficient manner at reasonable rates and to protect consumer interest. But there lie issues from generation to transmission including distribution, rural electrification, research and development, environmental issues, then energy conservation and human resource training. Geographical differences between these countries also possess a challenge and it calls for a different approach depending on resources available in different countries to attain 100% electrification. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this backdrop, let us quickly go through some of the important points mentioned in this article like what is the status of electrification in the South Asian nations and we will also discuss the position of India also in that. And lastly, let us see some of the measures suggested by the author to attain 100% electrification. Okay. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See, as you know, South Asia has almost a fourth of the global population living on 5% of the world's landmass. So, the electricity generation in South Asia has risen exponentially from 340 terawatt hours in 1990 to 1500 terawatt hour in 2050. See, Bangladesh has achieved 100% electrification recently. While if you take Bhutan, Maldives and Sri Lanka, they accomplished that in 2019 itself. Here, electrification refers to the process of replacing technologies that use fossil fuels like coal, oil and natural gas with technologies that use electricity as a source of energy. Okay? Or in simple words, electrification is nothing but a global mega trend that is based on a gradual shift to renewable energy sources. Like you can say wind, then solar, photovoltaic power, like that. Okay? For India and Afghanistan, the figures of electrification are 94.4% and 97.7% respectively. 
that is you can understand that afghanistan is more but when you take pakistan it is only 73.91 percentage electrified see bhutan has the cheapest electricity price in south asia which is around us dollar of 0.036 per kilowatt hour okay while india if you take it has the highest that is us dollar of 0.08 per kilowatt hour see the bangladesh government has significantly revamped power production resulting in power demands from 4942 kilowatt hour in 2009 to 25514 megawatt as of 2022 See, India is trying to make a transition to renewable energy to provide for 40% of total consumption, while Pakistan is still struggling to reduce power shortage, negatively impacting its economy. So far, we discussed the status of electricity production in various South Asian countries. Okay, and we saw the status of India also. Now, you might have a doubt: Why is electrification given such a high priority? Now, let me tell you why. See, a 0.46 percentage increase in energy consumption leads to 1 percent increase in GDP per capita. In that way, electrification not only helps in improving lifestyle but also adds to the aggregate economy. How it is done? It is done by improving the nation's GDP. Especially for middle-income countries, the generation of power plays an essential role in the economic growth of the country. More electricity leads to increased investment and economic activities both within and outside the country so making it a more viable alternative than other types of investment such as foreign direct investment okay see the south asian nations have greatly benefited from widening electricity coverage across industries and households now along with this nation's gdp growth it helps in achieving many sustainable development goals For example, solar power driven electrification in rural Bangladesh is a huge step towards sustainable development goal 7. What is that? See, sustainable development goal 7 is ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all by 2030. Okay? So this program engaged more than 1 lakh female solar entrepreneurs which also helped in achieving the sustainable development goal 5 what is that see sdg 5 is achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls am i right so indirectly the electricity generation improvement is helping in gender equality okay Then India's pledge to move to 40 percentage of total energy produced to renewable energy is also a very big step. Not only this, see, access to electricity improves infrastructure. Am I right? So here, what SDG goal is getting covered? Yes, it is the Sustainable Development Goal number nine, which is build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. Then if you take the energy access it helps online education through affordable internet so here it helps in achieving sdg 4 that is sustainable development goal number 4 what is that it is ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all not only this more people are employed am i right so it helps in achieving sdg goal number 1 which is no poverty and finally all are able to access tech based health solutions so here it is helping to achieve sustainable development goal number 3 which ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all at all stages so this is why electrification is very much important interestingly the south asian leaders are increasingly focused on efficient innovative and advanced methods of energy production for what they are doing all this this is for achieving 100% electrification i hope you remember this incident uh, where in the prime minister of india mr narendra modi in his net zero by 2070 pledge which he took at the cop 26 in glasgow asserted india's target to increase the capacity of renewable energy from 450 gigawatt to 500 gigawatt and he said this will be achieved by 2030 so here comes a question how will india attain its goal and for this the author 
of this editorial article suggests proper implementation of bilateral and multilateral energy trade agreements here comes the role of sarc that is south asian association for regional cooperation see it prepared the regional energy cooperation framework in 2014 but its implementation is questionable and there are still a number of bilateral and multilateral energy trade agreements such as india nepal petroleum pipeline deal then india bhutan hydroelectric joint venture then you can take myanmar bangladesh india gas pipeline then bangladesh bhutan india nepal sub regional framework for energy cooperation and the turkmenistan afghanistan pakistan india pipeline that is tapi pipeline see all needed proper implementation that is a problem here it is all well planned but the implementation is still questionable so the author is suggesting for proper implementation of all bilateral and multilateral energy trade agreements okay then secondly the author suggests for transnational energy projects see south asia's regional geopolitics is determined by the conflation of identity politics and international borders when you take the transnational energy projects it would engage with multiple social and ideational issues see this is a major limitation for peaceful energy trade so if you take the energy trade it is linked and perceived through the lens of conflict resolution and peace building then a regional security approach with a broader group of stakeholders could help smoothen the energy trade process and thirdly the author is suggesting that there is a need for resilient energy framework such as better building design practices climate proof infrastructure a flexible monetary framework and an integrated resource plan that supports renewable energy innovation see why the author is stressing for renewable energy because we are at a pressure to address the climate change issues also so relying on renewable energy is very much mandatory and finally according to the article government alone cannot be the provider of reliable and secure energy frameworks private sector investment is also crucial the public private collaboration can be a forerunner in addressing the world's most populated regions energy transition concerns so the author has suggested these four measures one is about the proper implementation of the bilateral and multilateral energy trade agreements then the second one is about the transnational energy projects and the third one he is suggesting for the resilient energy frameworks okay which will help in addressing the climate change issues and finally the author is suggesting that there should be private sector investment which is a crucial part in this okay so that's all about this news article so we had discussed in detail the status of electrification in the south asian nations and we had concentrated the status of india also in this and then we saw what is the importance of this electrification why we are talking about this and what are all the goals that is sustainable development goals that you can achieve out of this electrification process and lastly we covered a wider scope of this that is how india can achieve its targets in this electrification process especially the target that the prime minister has set in the cop 26 in glasgow meeting okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion see today i have three preliminary question for you now let's look at the first question it is regarding a vermin discussion so it is a two statement question whenever you get a two statement question i had told that you have to go through both the statement before arriving at your answer now look at the first statement it is correct see center by notification can declare a wild animal as vermin which will be included in the schedule 5 for a period specified in the notification so it is understood that once the central government through its notification declares a wild animal as vermin it will be included in the schedule 5 of the wildlife protection act 1972 okay so statement 1 is correct now look at the second statement it is incorrect why see this we saw in the discussion itself the central government may by notification declare any wild animal other than those specified in schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2 
of the wildlife protection act as vermin animal okay excluding these both that is schedule 1 and part 2 of schedule 2 of wildlife protection act other animals can be declared as vermin okay that is why statement 2 which says any wild animal can be declared as a vermin if it causes harm to crops and human beings is incorrect okay now look at the question it is asking for correct statements so your answer here will be option a one only is the correct statement okay now look at the second question it is regarding the national commission for protection of child rights okay it is also a two statement question so here you are going to go through both the statements and finalize your answer okay see the first statement is incorrect why because the national commission for protection of child rights was set up in march 2007 and it was set up under the commissions for protection of child rights act 2005 whenever a body is set under an act it comes under statutory body and it is not a constitutional body so statement 1 is incorrect now look at the second statement it is correct see this is one of the functions of the national commission for the protection of child rights see ncpc or inspects any juvenile custodial home or any other place of residence or institution meant for children where the children are detained or lodged for the purpose of treatment reformation or protection okay so statement 2 is correct now look at the question it is demanding for correct statement so your answer here will be option b 2 only is the correct statement okay now look at the last question see it is regarding our economic concept discussion okay here the question is asking for consider the following statements with reference to labor force participation rate and choose the incorrect option four options are given you are going to choose the incorrect option okay here the answer will be option c see this we saw in the discussion itself clearly right the labor force participation rate is an estimate of an economy's active force that is labor force participation rate is defined as the section of working population in the age group of 15 to 59 in the economy who are currently employed or seeking employment the formula we saw is number of people who are employed or actively seeking employment divided by the total working age population that is people who are belonging to the age group of 15 to 59 years okay and it is defined as a percentage of population in the labor force so the option c which says it includes only the section of the population who are currently employed is incorrect this definition is for workforce not for labor force participation rate okay now displayed here is a mains practice question please go through the question and write your answers and post it in the comment section if you like this video do like share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the shankar ias academy's youtube channel Thank you for listening.